You've taken an NGS test of your Y-DNA. Now, how can you understand the results? How can you sort the mass of data you are given into patterns that mean something to you? This is the second part of a presentation that was originally given at the recent Who Do You Think You Are Live event in Birmingham in April 2016, re-recorded with a few new or revised slides. Part 1 covered the basics of SNP testing, and in Part 2 we will examine some more advanced issues surrounding SNP tests, especially next generation sequencing or NGS tests, and how you, the new tester, can make best use of your results. It's important to realise that SNP reads from NGS tests are not always black and white, and often need to be judged in terms of probabilities. Let's look at some examples using data from YFull reports. These are SNPs referred to in part one. This one, YP355, is a major branch marker in the R1A haplogroup. This YFull report table lets us see it's a nice, clear read. The site was read 71 times in the test, and all of them show the SNP. Here we can see the mutated value A and the ancestral original value T. 71A then means it's a solid positive call for YP355, and Wifel like this one. They've given it five stars. Here's another further down the tree, and this one defines the Kemp families from Cavan in Ireland, as it is only found in them. This time on 11 reads, much lower, but still 100% mutated, and again it's five stars. Though 11 reads is much lower, FTDNA and most analysts are happy to accept a call like this with 11 reads. But how low can we go? Here is another from the same family branch in Kemp of Cavan, and this time the SNP was read only three times. Can we trust this call? It's a very marginal call. But as you can see, Wifel rated it still a good four stars. And Sanger Single Snip Testing has confirmed that this one is a real snip for this family line. But others might turn out to be less reliable. Here is the question then. Where do we set the limit for the minimum read coverage? Some may say 10 reads as a minimum. But then this perfectly good SNP, Y13520, would not have been discovered. It gets more complicated when different reads come up with different calls at the same position. This is very common, and there are a lot of reasons for it to do with the nature of the testing technology or the reference human genome sequence used to build the sequence after the test. So this example, then, is uh, still a good solid SNP. It's the Cummings YP984, which we looked at in part one. It has 69 reads, that's good, but not 100% for the mutation, as a couple of different calls are popping up here. But here we can see that over 96% of the calls show the mutation, which is pretty high, and Wifel convert that into a probability of error. Here, 0.037, or less than 4 chances in 100. This is another 5-star SNP, so they must think that's high enough. So how about this one? Again, it's found in the same SNP block as YP984 for the Cummings. Now, over one quarter of the reads this time are ancestral, 14 out of 52. And the chance of error is now estimated at about 0.33, or just about one chance in three. Is that too high? It is for most people, and why fool clearly don't like this one-star SNP. Though it has to be said, it has behaved completely consistently across all the testers in the group so far. But this shows up another challenge from NGS tests. What to do with such... Big word alert now, heterozygous reads, 
that is, reads giving more than one result at the same site. Along with low read results, these low quality results can make NGS results difficult to interpret. At this point, if you're running for the cover of your project admin, I wouldn't blame you. But there's still a lot that testers can do to understand their own NGS test results. First, let's bust some of the jargon I've been using, and which you will come across when hearing people discuss NGS results. First, base pairs, or BP, are the DNA letters, the paired A's, C's, T's and G's that make up your genome sequence. And the test will achieve a particular sequence length, usually expressed as so many million BP, or as, say, 55% of the readable Y sequence. That's roughly what the big Y test achieves. In NGS testing, your DNA is broken up into random fragments, and the test is able to read certain lengths of the fragments from each end. This is the read length possible in the test, the big Y, for example, being able to read lengths of 100 base pairs. Because there are many fragments of DNA read in the test, some will be read many times and others not so many like the SNPs on the previous slide. So a region read 71 times will be labelled 71x, while one read three times just 3x. And there will be an average depth coverage for the whole test too. The higher it is, the more accurate the test results will be. Once all the fragments of the tested DNA are read into their 100 BP lengths, the results must be given a precise position on the Y. This is mapping the reads, and it's done by comparing each read to the human reference Y sequence to build up your sequence. The reference sequence is a work in progress, and there are regular releases of new versions. But the commercial NGS tests currently use the one known as HG19 or BUILD37 from the Genome Reference Consortium. This was released in 2009 and the more recent BUILD38 came out in 2013. This is a more up-to-date and accurate version of the human genome. And if NGS test results were mapped to it instead, there may be more accurate designations of SNPs but the coordinates of known SNPs in the Y chromosome would also all change. It may be confusing at first, but it may well happen before too long and will probably improve the calls from the tests. So having covered these key terms in NGS testing, let's see how the two main tests, FTDNA's Big Y and Full Genome's Y Elite 2, compare. Big Y has the edge in depth coverage, while Y Elite scores highly on read length, though it's not completely clear on their site what read lengths they actually achieve in the tests. The chief difference is in the sequence length of the two tests. With Y Elite covering some 90% of the readable Y, we'll take a look shortly at what that means, to Big Y's 55%. However, when we look at how many of those sites are covered by highly reliable mapping, the difference between the two tests is much less. These differences should be weighed up along with the very different costs for taking each, and the time lengths they take to run by anyone thinking of taking an NGS test. Finally, both NGS tests can reveal about 90% of the standard 111 STR markers. And many more STRs can be extracted from your NGS test results by analysts. So it can be seen that the two commercial NGS tests are very different in terms of the regions of the Y they sequence. But it may not be necessary to read all of the Y to find significant SNPs. Less than half the Y is considered readable at all. Some long, repetitive regions cannot be sequenced reliably. 
Even the readable stretch divides into different regions, some of which are much better than others for finding useful SNPs. And here is a model of the regions of the Y chromosome showing the areas that cannot be sequenced in the green and red shaded areas. And if we zoom in on the readable stretch here, roughly between positions 3 to 29 million, we can see that this also breaks down into distinctive regions. Of these, the X-degenerate region in yellow tends to be the best for hunting stable and reliable SNPs, which can be retested and confirmed by Sanger testing. Some parts of the Ampliconic region in blue are also good targets, but these also contain long identical stretches of DNA, called palindromes, where SNPs can be unstable. Here we have another model of the Y chromosome, more detailed here, showing which regions of the Y are targeted by the big Y and Y elite tests, respectively. This really useful guide has been compiled by Ian MacDonald of the R1B U106 project. And anyone who's a member of that project has a superb resource to consult here, full of information about NGS testing and the history of the U106 subclade. As you can see here, the yellow X-degenerate and blue ampliconic regions are both well covered in both commercial NGS tests. This guide by Ian MacDonald goes into far more detail on the strengths and weaknesses of the tests than we can cover in this talk, so definitely worth consulting. So if your interest in DNA testing is to help your genealogy research what does all this mean to you? Well, you'll want to extend your tree back in time and link it to the trees of other relatives. So tree building with reliable SNP markers is the name of the game. In future, tests will read much more of the Y, of the whole genome in fact, to greater levels of reliability. But while the technology is still developing today, the current types of NGS tests have dramatically increased what we can find out using them. When choosing a test for yourself or your male relative, do bear in mind that doing a test with longer sequence coverage might not necessarily add a lot of reliable and stable SNPs. There is a cost coverage ratio, and it may be that the best strategy for you is to test more people rather than more sequence. Remember, these DNA tests have little value on their own. We need other test results to compare them with. To identify the quality and reliability of all these new SNPs, it's necessary to obtain the raw data from your test. For big Y, that is, if you do Y Elite, then FGC will analyze it for you. So then you can send it on to the analysts. Back to some more jargon busting then, as there are two important types of presentation of your raw data. And in fact, as both of these are already processed to some extent, they're not truly raw, but they are in formats that the analysts can work with. The VCF, or Variant Call File, is a list which can be opened in a spreadsheet or word processor of the sites that were read in your test with the result at each. It does not contain all of the sites, only those that are above a read depth threshold of minimum 10 reads for Big Y. This is why the second format, the BAM, or Binary Alignment Map file, is essential for analysts to work with. It contains all the data from the test for every site that's read, with the read depths, the calls, and a quality rating. This forms the basis of the analysis that's offered by YFull or FGC. The big tree, on the other hand, works mainly from the VCF files. All the analysts can discover only what's presented in these file formats, although that is a lot. 
So there's a quick overview of how to obtain your raw data files um, for the Big Y test in this case. You go to your Big Y results page and you will see this button here to download your raw data on the upper right of the screen. This is only available to you in your FTDNA account to protect your privacy. Project admins cannot see this, so if you want them to look at your raw data, you have to get the file for them and send it. Next, you'll see these buttons. You can download the VCF straight away, but the BAM file needs to be requested, and the company will then prepare it for you. When you're informed your BAM is ready, you'll see this changed set of buttons. It's a good idea to archive your BAM to your computer as a backup. But don't try to email it to anyone, it's a very big file. Instead, click on Share BAM, and you'll be given a special temporary URL, which you can send to any third party who you want to have a copy of your BAM, and they can download it directly. So, back to the test process. When your results are in, you'll at first receive a list of sites where you appear to have SNPs. Correctly speaking, these are variants, and there needs to be a filtering process to remove variant calls that are not useful to you. Many people have their own programs and systems for doing this, and here's one we use in the Cummings project using Excel. First, we filter out and remove all the variants which are not really novel, or which are already named and placed on the draft tree. And as discussed in part one, we also want to filter out all those name snips which look poor quality calls. Which leaves you with a much shorter list, which are your own genuine novel variants, ones that really have not been encountered before. In a last step, you can filter against other people in your immediate group to see if they might share any of these with you. If they do, then you've discovered a new branch marker which helps to further build out your tree. Ones that only you have, then, would be your private SNPs. And the number of these depends on how close other people are to you in the tree. If you have near cousins in your tree, you may have very few, or a lot more if you have no near relatives in the branch of your SNP tree. In your NGS test results, then, there'll be plenty of wheat and chaff to separate. But as these tests are about discovery of new SNPs and new branches in the descent tree, it's actually a good thing that they offer more than we need. So there's less risk of missing something important as we sort through the chaff. But there are reasons why some variants may be good or bad. It's also the case that different third-party analysts and they get slightly different results to each other. So to finish off part two, we'll look more closely at some of these reasons and differences. Among the factors affecting the accuracy of the results is the test itself. Although NGS testing is claimed to achieve 99.99% accuracy, this still leaves a small possibility of error, and when dealing with millions of sites, erroneous calls can happen. As we have seen, the genome reference sequence used in mapping can be a source of error, and a change to the newest reference sequence can eliminate a number of faulty calls. It's possible that some red sequences can be misaligned against the reference sequence which is one likely explanation for why some sites have two different results called. Many stretches of the genome are very similar to each other, and sequences that belong to a different chromosome can be aligned against your Y, leading to mixed or incorrect calls. And the raw data format chosen for analysis can also lead to some results being overlooked, and different analysts might themselves set different criteria or thresholds for including a call or ruling it out. Will they insist on a minimum of, of 10 reads, for example, or 5 reads? And this can lead to some SNPs being missed, as we saw in slide 2. 
you may notice that a lot of SNPs discovered by older technology or processes now look a little shaky as NGS test results start to swell in number. Many of these carry names and might appear in your report at YFUL, but will also carry very low quality ratings and appear on many branches of the Y tree looking unreliable as branch markers. So taking the test first, although NGS testing is said to be 99.99% accurate, there is still scope for a small degree of false negatives, that is the SNP is present but the test does not find it, or false positives, the SNP is reported but it's not really there. Here we see a few causes for each. False negatives generally are to do with the coverage of the test. The SNP site is not read, or not read with enough read depth or quality to find the SNP. Increasing the coverage and the read lengths in future may reduce the risk that SNPs are missed. False positive calls are a bigger problem in NGS, but there are usually identifiable reasons as to why they occur. Some are listed here. And it's worth checking your novel variants for issues like these. When in doubt, set up a Sanger retest to confirm whether or not there's a real SNP call. If a Sanger test cannot be done, that's a strong clue that there is a problem with the call. Some of these may be alleviated by future changes in the reference sequence. Testers who use more than one analyst commercial groups or project admins may also notice some inconsistencies between them. At least one lot may call SNPs, the others ignore, so your SNP inventories from each look a little different to each other. Again, these can be traceable to which thresholds each analyst sets for including or rejecting a SNP, and which file type they're reading your data from. A few example criteria from some popular analysts and the ISOG tree are compared here. The overall picture is that each can be seen as strict on some areas and less so on others. The best thing is to use several analysts if you can and take each as a source for more new SNPs that you can aim to check and confirm through further testing of yourself or other members of your group or family. So to sum up the second part of the talk, the tester confronting NGS test results may find them confusing and with a lot of apparent inconsistencies. Part of this is to allow new discoveries to be made and not missed. The best strategy is to use third-party analysts, as many of them as might be available to you. In the third and final part of the talk, we'll turn to looking at how results from SNP tests, SDR tests, and genealogy research can be brought together to build descent trees.